In today's video, we'll take a journey through Amigawa's history, from its inception in 1985 to the present day. We will not be uh, delving into the alternatives like Eros or Morphos in this video, only Amigawa's. Amigawa's is uh, put together through a few components like Kickstarter and Workbench. Uh, but in this video, to keep it simple, I will refer to it as Amigawa's. So stay tuned for hopefully a fascinating trip down memory lane. Let's start from the beginning. We are at the very beginning in 1985 with Amiga OS version 1. The early versions of Amiga OS had a unique blue and orange color that made the user be able to see and read on old and bad TV screens. Users could change the colors if they preferred. Version 1 and version 1.1 were only available on the Amiga 1000. But version 1.3 became available on the popular Omega 500. Workbench were delivered on three floppy disks. It was one of the first 32-bit uh, home operating systems and one of the very earliest to multitask. And we can't forget the famous synthesized speech we all know as SAY. This version also include the only software Microsoft has ever made for the Amiga, Amiga Basic. Let's do some time traveling uh, up to 1990 and Amiga was 2. In 1990, Amiga was 2 came out, bringing significant improvement to the Amiga operating system's interface. They replaced the strong blue and orange color with a more soothing gray and light blue, which they stick to after this version. It also had a 3D effect on the window borders. It looked very nice for its time. Workbench was no longer limited to specific display modes, making it easier for future upgrades when graphic cards and stuff like that appeared. I am still around. They also introduced a consistent look and feel by creating the Amiga style guide and providing tools to help developers make their software match this style. This included the library GAD tools for creating graphical elements, the installer for software installation scripts, and the Amiga guide for hypertext help. Workbench 2.4 added Rx support, a scripting language for the entire system. Programmers could add Rx ports to their software, allowing them to control by Rx script. This made it possible for different programs from different makers to work together smoothly. It was released for the i500+, plus, A600, A3000, and the A3000 Tower. We have reached 1992, and I'm sitting at my favorite Amiga of them all, the Amiga 1200. Amiga was 3.0, came out in 1992, and they released version 3.1 between 1993 for the CD32 and 1994 for other Amiga models, like the Amiga 1200. Interestingly, Amiga OS 3.1 happened to be the last version that Commodore, the company behind it, put out. Now, in this three series, they did a few things. First, they made sure it worked with newer Amiga models. But the really cool stuff was the new future they added. They introduced something called data types, Think of it like a universal language for different kinds of data, like pictures, sound, and text. 
even if programs didn't understand these data types directly, data types made it possible to handle them through standard plugs. This was a bit like how object-oriented operating system works. They brought this in with AmigaOS 3.0. They also made colors look better on high color display and supported a new, the new AGI chipset, which was also a part of 3.0. Then with AmigaOS 3.1, they added CD-ROM support. That was necessary because of the Amiga CD32. Nineteen ninety nine. Those years where we were starting to lose hope, but there were still some hope. Amiga was three point five, and directly after, Amiga was three point nine. So let's just dive into the chaos. Commodore has gone bankrupt. And the next player in the Amiga game was Hoge and Partner. After a pretty long and rocky development phase, they unveiled Amiga OS 3.5 in October 1999. It marked the first OS upgrade in five long years. So what did it bring to the table? Well, for starters, it improved support for more modern hardware. It added new features to beef up the core operating system. Those little hacks and add-ons that we, as users, had been using to enhance uh, our Amigas, like new icons, uh, uh, I can't remember the names of all the hacks we used. Many of them were now outdated and made our Amigas uh, crashing, to be honest. But now it was officially integrated into Amiga 3.5. Stuff like WorkOS that uh, made us use the PowerPC as a co-CPU. AmigaOS 3.5 also supported larger hard drives, uh, those larger than 4 gigabyte, huge monsters, and other devices. It also, as I said, had built-in support for PowerPC through WorkOS. And let's not forget the Cherry it finally came with a TCP IP stack. This was a pretty significant step forward for the Amiga community. So 1999 ended, 2000 started, and a bit out in the year 2000, here comes a bit of a surprise. Amiga was 3.9. This announcement and launch caught pretty much off guard. They made the announcement in the fourth quarter of the year 2000, and guess what? It was almost ready to roll. That's right, for the first time in Amiga's history, a product was actually shipped on the promoted day. Now, at the time of the press announcement, they had locked down the future list and they put in a lot of work to squash many of the peaky bugs. Some folks argued that this was proof that the classic Amiga OS development should be handed over to Hoge and Partner. While OS 3.5 aimed to fix those old lingering bugs, OS 3.9 had a different mission. It wanted to bring in functions that didn't quite make it into previous releases and make third-party software fit right in. It set out to provide a bunch of basic tools to guide future developments and give the operating system the kind of future you'd expect from a modern operating system. This included better support for standard file formats like AVI and MP3. And they also sprouted up the user interface to make it look even better. Quite the upgrade. Two thousand and six, a new version of Amiga is rolled out in December twenty four, two thousand and six, a Christmas present, and it was a big deal. Hyperion Entertainment, a company from Belgium, had been working on it for five long years. 
and they are licensed from Amiga Incorporated, especially for the Amiga One registered users. The Amiga One was a PowerPC based new Amiga. During those five years, folks who owned Amiga One machines could grab pre releases version of Amiga 4.0 from Hyperion. Surprisingly, these pre releases were pretty stable and reliable. The last stable version of Amiga 4.0 for the Amiga One computers, known as the July 2007 update, dropped for download on July the 18th, 2007 for registered users of the Amiga One machines. Now, for classic Amiga computers with Cyberstorm PowerPC and Blizzard PowerPC accelerator cards, Amigas for classic became available for sale in November 2007. Before that, it had only been accessible to developers and beta testers. Here's the big change. Amiga OS 4 became PowerPC native, saying goodbye to Motorola's 68K processor line. It could run on certain PowerPC hardware, including the A1200, A3000 and A4000 with PowerPC accelerator boards, as well as the famous Amiga 1. Now, Amiga Inc. had some rules about distributing Amiga OS 4 and later version. They insisted that if you wanted to use the OS with third-party hardware, you had to bundle it together. The only exception was Amigas with Phase 5 PowerPC accelerator boards. For those, you could buy the OS separately. Fast forward a bit, and Amiga OS 4.1, which I'm running here, made its debut to the public on July the 11th, 2008. Up until this point, everything's been straightforward, with version numbers ticking along as time rolls on. But this is where things take a turn. We enter 2018, and Omega was 3.1. 4 arrives. It's September 2018. Hyperion Entertainment rolled out AmigaOS 3.1.4. This update was packed with fixes and upgrades, like better support for larger hard drives right from boot up. Compatibility with the full line of the Motorola 68000 CPUs, including the 68060. And a snazzy new look for Workbench, complete with an optional set of icons. Now, here's where things get a bit tricky. You see, the version number caused a bit of confusion in the Amiga community because it came after Amiga 3.5 and 3.9, and even after Amiga OS 4. But the reason behind this numbering is that they basically started from scratch with the original 3.1 source code from Commodore. The source code for both 3.5 and 3.9 by Hogan Partners couldn't be used due to licensing issues. And 4 was specially for the PowerPC platform, so they decided to stick with 3.1.4. But the cool thing is, 3.1.4 still supports the old school Motorola 68000 CPUs, all of them which means it works with a full range of classic Amiga computers, even the A500 and the A1000. We are about to enter the present date. 2021. Amiga was 3.2. Hyperion Entertainment drops Amiga as 3.2. This one includes everything from the previous version, 3.1.4, and throws in some goodies like support for Reaction GUI from AmigaOS 3.9, which in some ways you can compare to uh, GTK in Linux. And what's very cool is that this version of AmigaOS still gets updates 
to this day. And the latest version, 3.2.2, was released April 2003. So the Omega is still alive. Hopefully, I need to make a follow-up on this with future versions. But what should you do with all this information and what version should you use? If your main goal is to enjoy demos and games, I suggest you use the original Commodore Amiga OS 3.1. However, if you're thinking about using your Amiga for a more retro desktop computer experience, uh, using Deluxe Paint, uh, listening to modules, making modules, uh, programming, etc., etc., I suggest you use Amiga OS 3.2. Unless you own a PowerPC Amiga, then your only choice is Amiga OS 4, or maybe have a look into Morpho OS. Have a wonderful weekend. Cheers. Oh, my God.